Well, hello. So here we are for lesson two, critical reading. <clears throat> As you can see there, it says part one. So we're going to be starting a critical reading unit that will really take us through the next four weeks of class. Uh, last week was introduction and basically to some fundamental concepts like rhetoric. And basically the rest of the first half of the quarter is spent on critical reading. So this is the beginning of a unit where you're going to learn some strategies for critical reading and then be asked to apply those strategies. First by designing a reading guide, which will be due next week, and then at the end of the unit in a few weeks, a uh, essay where you sh utilize and show your critical reading skills. So you, what you might be thinking right now is, why critical reading? Um, and this chart here explains why. Um, reading and writing share a cyclical relationship. You might be asking why reading since it's a writing class, it's a composition class. Well as the diagram shows, reading and writing go hand in hand. There's plenty of research that shows that if one is doing a lot of critical reading they'll get better at writing and if one is writing a lot they'll get better at reading. Um, and beyond just the research that shows that, um, speaking from experience, if you're, if you're reading a lot of things, engaging with those ideas that are present in the articles, the things you're reading, um, you'll do a better job being able to write about that subject. Um, you'll, you'll pick up skills, things that are helpful in the writing. Another question you might have is, well, why do we need to learn to read, right? You might be saying, I'm in college. I already know how to read. Reading is a skill like writing or playing football or anything else that one has to develop and hone and practice and get better at. Like playing a video game or learning a piano. To play piano, you need to keep practicing the skills to get better at them. Um, which we may not think about reading, because reading is something we do at a very young age, and we just kind of do instinctively and naturally from that point on. But reading, like any other skill, takes practice, and there are different degrees of skill at it. And it's one of the most fundamental things, one of the most fundamental skills you'll need for college. And so you can passively read something. You know, I read a lot of articles about football on my phone, and I don't engage with those to the same extent as I do when I'm reading an academic article. And so you can passively read something where you just kind of read it, or you can critically read something where you engage with it on a deeper level. And that's what we're going to be talking about. Well, how do you do that? That's what we're learning in this unit, is how to critically read something so that you really engage with it on a deeper level. That's what you'll be learning to do in this unit and then showing me that you can do on the assignments, the reading guide and the essay. So first what we're going to cover here are some key strategies, things you can do while you read to engage more deeply and intensely with the text. Um, these are in the reading from the textbook but I'm going to elaborate on, the textbook has a good list. I'm going to pick a few of the most important ones and elaborate on them in more detail here. Um, first is adjusting your reading speed. So if you're like me, you probably read a lot of things very quickly. But if you want to deeply engage with something that you're reading, you have to read more slowly. So depending on the difficulty of the text, um, the slower you want to read. You want to make sure you understand everything before moving on to the next paragraph or the next section. And you might have to read more slowly or even reread things to be able to do that. Annotating is also very important. This is where you take notes in the margins or the bottom of the page. So highlight things and make notes about them. Again, research shows that if people write while they read, they retain what they read better. So even if you could look up something online, even if you have a really good memory and you just remember what you read really well, um, and you feel like you don't need to write things down, just the act of writing it down, even if you never go back and look at those notes again, which I encourage you to do, but even if you don't, just the act of writing will help you remember it better. Um, and I do encourage you to go back, you know, if it's for a homework assignment, like the things you'll be reading in this class, then I really encourage you to go back and um, look at your notes, you know, make notes to yourself to help guide you through the reading, 
so that you can kind of quickly remember the most important parts. But even if you don't go back, the act of writing it down will help you remember it better. Summarizing. Um, the textbook talks about this, and I want to emphasize in your own words. So after you read a section of something or a paragraph, any part where there feel, feels like there's a real transition to a new topic in the reading, I highly recommend you just take a couple minutes, write a few sentences, summarizing what you just read in your own words. This goes right along with the annotating. The summaries can be very helpful for you when you look back, but also the act of putting it into your own words shows you really understand the idea. If you can say in your own words what the text means, then you've really understood it. And by writing that down, you'll remember it better. So summarize as you go so that when you're done, you could read through all your summaries and have a really good overview of the text. And you may not even have to read them because the act of summarizing, the act of writing will help you remember what it's about. Identifying patterns. So uh, writers will emphasize certain things. And if those ideas or concepts are very important to the writer, they'll emphasize them again and again. So what comes up multiple times? What is repeated? Um, those are things that are going to be important. So part of learning to read critically is how to identify what's most important and what's least important and discern that and make that distinction so you know what you really need to remember because you don't need to remember every single part of the kind of academic articles you'll read in college. So identifying patterns, things that are repeated and emphasized, you want to be able to look for those. And you'll get better at that as you go, but highlight things that stand out as important. If something comes up two or three times, highlight it. Um, look it up, make notes about it, try to understand what it is. Um, here we transition to these, these first four points were things you can do as you read to help you have a really good understanding of the text when you're done. Um, these next few points are going to be ones where you, you more engage with the text after you're done reading it uh, <coughs> to think about it more deeply now that you've retained the information because of these first four strategies to really think about it deeply to give your opinion to, to see how it informs your own view to see the relationship between your ideas and ideas in the text these are the next strategies for doing that so analyzing the argument what is the author saying when you're done reading it maybe try to summarize the whole thing or summarize the author's argument their main argument their thesis in just a couple sentences a lot of things you'll read in college, a lot of the pieces of writing you'll read in college don't necessarily put their argument at the forefront or in an easy to find place. So try to discern the argument and try to restate it in your own words. Uh, that'll be really helpful because the argument is the main part of it. The thesis, what are they saying? If you're going to engage with the article, you want to be able to engage with that. Believing and doubting. Um, this is a theory developed by Peter Elbow, a composition theorist. It's very helpful and important. Make a list of the different arguments or the different supporting points the author raises to support their view and see which ones you believe and which ones you doubt. Which ones do you agree with? Which ones do you disagree with and why? This can help you kind of pick apart the text and decide if you really agree with it or not and see how it fits in or doesn't with your own view. So kind of pick it apart and see which parts of it you're more willing to buy and which ones you're more likely to disagree with. Considering the larger context. So I mentioned this in the first lecture when I was talking about my teaching philosophy, but we readers and writers we don't live in a bubble we can't separate the world around us from what we write and so whether that's responding to a political view or something happening in the culture at large or a writers own history and background how they grew up what they believe in value all of those things affect that final product that's produced and in your writing in this class my hope is that you will bring those things into the class and, and write about things you care about but when you're reading something, it's helpful to think about what, um, how those things might be true for the author and, and what they believe or what cultural context may have influenced their writing. So do a little bit of research on the writer or the topic, you know, just quickly Googling them, try to find out more. 
there's also a sense of the context of pieces of writing have dialogue with other pieces of writing. So if I write an essay on social media use, I'm by by definition of doing that, by default, I'm engaging in a conversation with all of the other pieces that have ever been written on social media use. And and that's part of what we're going to do in this unit. For this unit, I'll say more about this in a bit, we have a topic of technology's influence on society. So all of the things we read are going to be making a comment on that topic and going to be talking to each other about that topic. Even if they don't directly mention one of each other, and some of them do directly mention each other, but even if they don't, they'll still be just by writing on a similar subject, they'll still be engaging with those articles, having a conversation. So to consider the larger context, you may also need to read other pieces on the subject to have a, a fuller picture of the context, the conversation about the subject. Um, so those are some strategies for critical reading. Um, take notes, highlight, summarize, read slowly, reread as you read, and then once you're done, think about the argument, what the author is saying, why they're saying it, and think about how that may fit with your own views or not. For the practical example of the part of this lecture, we're going to do a reading guide together. Um, <clears throat> so I want to take a couple minutes and talk about this before we transition into the actual reading guide. As I mentioned for this critical reading unit, which is weeks two through five or lessons two through five of the quarter, you're going to do two projects. The first one is a reading guide that's due at the end of week three, and then um, an actual essay to rough draft at the end of week four, final draft at the end of week five. And so, right now I'm going to take you through a reading guide. One, I've, I've developed two reading guides for two of the essays that are required for this section. With the first one, I'm going to take you through and show you how I would answer the questions. And it's on an article called Just One More Game. The other article that's part of the required reading for this week is Google Making Us Stupid. That reading guide I'm not going to take you through the answers for, and that's actually your homework. That's your discussion board assignment, is to do the reading guide for is Google Making Us Stupid. So to go through and answer the questions for that one in a manner similar to the way I answer the questions for the first one in this demonstration. So there's kind of a set of scaffolded tiers here. First, I'll take you through a reading guide and demonstrate how to do a reading guide. The second kind of level here will be you giving your own answers to a reading guide I have designed. And the third and final step that won't, is not due till next week is you designing your own reading guide. And so there'll be kind of, as you learn the skill of critical reading, there's kind of three levels with which you'll engage with it and demonstrate it here. From just listening to the lecture and seeing a demonstration, to filling out a reading guide yourself, to making your own reading guide. And the reason we do the reading guides is to put the skills I just talked about in the previous part of the lecture to practical use. Um, again, to kind of demonstrate that you've learned these skills, and more importantly, to give you a set of questions to ask any time you read something in college. We talked about those strategies <coughs> of how to critical read, to summarize, annotate, highlight, reread, read slowly. But then after that, critically engaging with the text, thinking about it, analyzing the argument. Um, there are certain questions you can ask, certain things to look for in order to do that. And those are the questions I have posed on the reading guide here, on both these reading guides, the one I'm going to do and the one you're going to do. Uh, they both have really fundamental questions. Some of the questions, as you'll see, are specific. Others are more general. And the more general ones, you could ask of almost anything you read. And so the idea here, part of the idea here is to give you some fundamental skills you can use for beyond this class, for when you have to read difficult texts in other classes. Um, and so your reading guide can be similar to mine, and it should ask a lot of these same general questions with a few specific questions you come up at the end on your own. Um, but you'll also be filling out your own guide too. So um, this will make sense as we get further along and you see the assignment sheet and whatnot. The assignment sheet for the reading guide, I mean. But first, let's start by me taking you through a reading guide. So <clears throat> this is for the article, just one more game, 
by Sam Anderson, which is kind of his take on the games we play on smartphones, like Angry Birds, for example, or Fruit Ninja. And this is the first of a series of pieces we'll read for the class that deal with technology and its influence on our society, specifically with the recent technological developments such as smartphones, social media, smartphone and online games, etc. Um, these things are having a pervasive effect on our culture. A lot of people see it as positive, others see it as negative. Um, I picked this topic because I, I think it's something we're all familiar with, so it'll be an easy topic to engage with, but also a very important one in the time in which we live. Um, and so I'll take you through the reading guide for the Sam Anderson article here, just one more game, and then you'll fill out the answers for the reading guide to is Google making a stupid as your discussion board post for this week. So here we go. The first question is, state in your own words, which would you say the main argument of the article is? So this goes back to that first slide, or that first set of slides, the first part of this lecture, where we talked about the different strategies for critical reading, and it said, analyze the argument. And the textbook also talked about analyzing the argument. <clears throat> so after you've read the whole piece and you're filling out this guide, try to say in your own words, what would you say the main argument of the article is? Now you can highlight certain sentences if you think those are the thesis. There might be one or two sentences that seem like the thesis, and that's great. You can definitely include those. But also try to state it in your own words, because it's one thing to quote something. But if you can say in your own words what the quote means, then you've actually demonstrate that, demonstrated that you've understood it. And comprehension is more important than just the ability to quote. So let's take a look here. There's a couple of statements that I think represent his thesis or his main argument. First, as the quote from early on, I think it's just a few paragraphs in, today we are living for better and worse in a world of stupid games. Um, we'll talk more about the meaning of stupid games in a few minutes, but that's the term he uses to refer to games like Tetris and Angry Birds and Fruit Ninja throughout his article. Um, so this is kind of his thesis. I would say this is his thesis. It's, it's very early on, so before the reader gets too far, they know what he's saying. And the reason I highlighted, or excuse me, italicized the end there is we're used to hearing the phrase for better or worse. But he says for better and worse, so that makes it stand out. It's, it's, not, it's easy to miss that, but if you read it and you catch that, then it stands out because you're like, he changed that famous quote, but why did he do it? He's saying these games have both positive and negative effects is what that means. Um, but this is a very general thesis. It doesn't really stake out a clear position. He's kind of showing two sides of a topic which can be okay. For your papers in this class, I'd very much like you to have a clear, specific stance. Um, this is, I think, his thesis. I don't think it would work as a thesis in a class like this. He's writing for a very general audience in the New York Times, and I think it'll be a more important skill for you to learn to write to a specific audience, so having a specific thesis will help. Um, but this is his thesis. But because it's very general, I've also included another statement that I think gets more at what he's talking about. So toward the end of it, I think this is the last or second to the last sentence he says, maybe that's the secret genius of stupid games. They force us to make a series of interesting choices about what matters moment to moment in our lives. So what he's saying here is we make a conscious choice when we play a stupid game that takes up our time. And so by doing that, we make a choice about how we use our time. Now that's all negative, or that's not all negative. I mean, there is a negative component there in that it takes up our time, but there's also the, he also talks about the positive effects of playing these games. So we might be making a statement about, you know, I'm choosing to use my time this way because it helps me, or I'm choosing to use this time this way for a different reason. Uh, one way or another, I've chosen to play a stupid game with this time. And so that may be positive or negative, depending on how you look at it. So he, he hasn't necessarily changed his stance, but this is a more specific thesis, closer to the type of thesis I'm hoping to see in your papers, where he basically is saying here that stupid games are important. And though they may have both positive and negative effects, they do for, for those force us to 
do something important, which is make an important decision. So it's still kind of showing both sides, but it's a more specific stance because it shows how and why stupid games are important in our culture. Finally, we have in my words. So those are both quotes. So remember, for this part of the reading guide, I would also like you see try to try to see you try to state the thesis in your own words. So this is how I would paraphrase Anderson's thesis or his main argument. <coughs> Stupid games have become ubiquitous in our culture and have both positive and negative effects on our lives. That term ubiquitous means ever present or everywhere. So I'm saying Anderson's basically saying stupid games are all over the place. We can't ignore them. They're important and they have both positive and negative effects. Again, very general, but I think that's, you know, what his argument is. The next part here is rhetorical situation. So if you remember from last week, we went through rhetorical situation. Any situation where you have an author with a purpose communicating their idea or their purpose to an audience. So almost every situation we're in. And you, you went through lots of examples of these in your discussion board posts. So when you're reading an article or any piece of writing, it's a good idea to break down and analyze the rhetorical situation. Do a little mini rhetorical analysis like we practiced at the end of the lecture last time in that you did of your own rhetorical situation in your discussion board post. So apply that same kind of analysis you did in your discussion board post for your own situation last week and that I did of those commercials to the thing you're reading. And so I would say that Anderson's purpose is to make readers aware of stupid games and their effects. His audience is people who play stupid games which is almost probably everyone in our society. I mean, I'm sure there are some people who don't. I mean, I'm a pretty older person, not necessarily hip to what all of you young people are doing, but I still play Madden Mobile, and most of you probably play some kind of game on your phone, which is why I picked, one of the reasons why I picked this article. Um, even if you don't, or even if you know someone who doesn't, they're pretty ubiquitous in our culture, as I just said. So people probably have an opinion on this issue, or they probably encountered it. And this article was first published in the New York Times, which has a very general audience. So while it may specifically appeal to people who play stupid games, really anyone could read this, understand what he's talking about, and engage with it critically. The genre. This is both a print article and a web article. So it was printed in the New York Times, but it was also a web article, which is really interesting. Web articles on the, on the rise, and with the, this new technology we have, a web article is really cool, because you can include hyperlinks, pictures, videos, other similar things, and make the reading experience more interactive. And so if you look in the reading in the textbook, um, there's actually a hyperlink to the web version of this, and you can see the pictures and the videos Anderson has has on there and it really makes a lot of sense for his subject matter to to also have it as a web article. So that's an important rhetorical choice on his part that I think helps make him successful based on his subject matter. And web articles are becoming prominent enough that later in the quarter when you write your not the paper you're about to write but the final paper which is an analysis one of the main things you write in this type of class um, rather than having it be a traditional academic paper is going to be a web article and you're going to be asked to include pictures and or video and especially hyperlinks. So um, we'll do lots of practice with that and it'll be easy to do once you get to it because we'll really thoroughly covered it in the lectures and the reading. But um, this is a good early example for you to see and it, it, this example I think helps illustrate why it's an up and coming and useful and important genre of writing. His stance. So this is pretty similar to what I said on the last slide for his argument. Stupid games have both positive and negative effects. I think he leans more toward the negatives and the positives. He does point out the positives and he does acknowledge that he plays stupid games a lot, but I think he falls, again, he doesn't make it clear, but I think he falls more in the camp of it, the negatives outweighing the positives, although he certainly does outline some of the positives. Finally, the media or design. So as I said, because it's a web article, it's both print and digital, and it allows them to have illustrations, and then there's actually a kind of a simulation of a game you can watch, which I think is really effective. If anyone were reading this who never played a stupid game, that little video would be very helpful for them. So 
very successful in terms of the rhetorical situation, in terms of his choices regarding genre and media and design. So after you've identified the argument, summarized it or paraphrased it in your own words, and kind of broken down the rhetorical situation, and you have a pretty thorough understanding of the different pieces of the article and how they work, uh, the next step is to look at key concepts and key terms. That's an important thing to do when you're reading, doing that critical reading. I really could have had this on that earlier slide. If there's certain words or phrases that are repeated over and over again, especially if they're words you may not know the definition for, or that the author is using in a unique and specific way, either words they made up or words they're kind of using in a new way, like he's doing with stupid games here. He doesn't exactly mean they're stupid, um, but we'll see why he chose that word and why it fits. So highlighting and defining those key words or key terms is something you should do as you read. And key concepts are kind of more like ideas or arguments, things that are a little bit longer than just a word or phrase. And so picking out both of those is important as you read. For concepts, we have um, one of his, I think, key ideas is that video games reflect their culture of origin. For example, during the Depression, the board game Monopoly was invented, and so people didn't have a lot of money then, but you could basically become a tycoon playing Monopoly. So it was kind of a great feeling of escapism for people at the time. In Risk, if you know the board game Risk, it came out during the Cold War. Um, and so again, it would have been very cathartic for people at that time. Um, and, and I think this is an important concept. There, there, there are a lot more concepts than two which are how many I highlighted. And I think the reading guide you're going to fill out asks you to find three or four. But the reason I picked this one is it seems important in that these stupid games really reflect the culture of this time because everyone is on their phone all the time and stupid games are one of the things you do on your phone. So stupid games intrude on other parts of our lives. In other words, if you want to play Monopoly or Risk, you had to stop and do that and make a conscious choice and devote time to do that. And as he says later, we still make choices when we play stupid games, but we can play them in line at the grocery store, or we may be doing something else on our phone and we come across the game, and then all of a sudden we're doing it for 40 minutes even, as he says, um, when we didn't necessarily set that si time aside in advance like we would have to play an older game. And before smartphones is what I mean by older game. And this is important because he says stupid games have existed since the beginning of time um, in different forms. So playing stupid games is part of human nature. What he's saying here is that because of the smartphone, that's a significant development because how we use our time to play stupid games is now different than it was before, even though it's part of our human nature to play them. All right, a couple of key words, and again, there are a lot of these. But um, I've picked out two that seem really important. So stupid games. Um, and parties calling them stupid because they're simple. And I think he's trying to draw attention to the fact that they're simple. They don't have a long narrative like a lot of the games people play on Xbox or PlayStation. But that's part of why they work. Anybody can play them almost anywhere and we do the same repetitive thing over and over again, whether it's Tetris or Angry Birds or Fruit Ninja. There's not a lot of depth there in terms of the type of things we're doing. So we do the same repetitive actions over and over again, and we like it. Just like with these early examples, like Monopoly and Risk and the really old examples he gives, we enjoy doing the same repetitive thing over and over again in these types of games. So they're kind of stupid for that reason. So he's not necessarily using stupid in a negative sense. He's more using it to draw our attention to the fact that we become so hooked on doing something over and over again that's not very complicated. In the games for change model, this is uh, someone else's idea he quotes when he's talking about the positives. And basically, play, this author he's quoting, the, the idea of play, playing a game is a very healthy thing, which I think it is. We all, you know, all work and no play makes someone a dull person. I think that's really true, and we can see that here. And this theorist he's quoting even goes so far as to argue that kind of the model games use um, <clears throat> for their gameplay could be applied in other parts of life 
for like a healthy outcome, which with the point system and Weight Watchers being one example of that. And so games for change, meaning that gameplay can have a positive effect on other parts of our lives, change them in a positive way. So these, those are two terms that seem really important to understanding his article. So thus far I've gone through um, some really important aspects of any article. Those first four questions are general questions you could apply to almost anything you read. What is the argument? What is the rhetorical situation? What are some key concepts? And what are some key terms or words? Now we're going to move into more specific things, things specific to this particular article. So when you develop your own reading guide next week, you'll still be asked to do some of these things, like those first four questions you want to have on your own reading guide. But for your particular essay that you've picked from the list of possibilities, you'll also want to come up with some specific things unique to that essay. And that's what we're going to go over here as an example of some specific things from just one more game. One is including other voices. So this is a general thing in terms of everything you read, you should think about how the author includes other voices. But you'll want to find you know, specific quotes or specific things unique to this article, because each one will include different voices. Um, the reason for this is, like I said before, we don't live in a bubble, we don't read and write in a bubble. So this article is part of a larger conversation. It's talking to every other article out there on stupid games. And because he makes a big argument with large implications, it's also speaking to really any article that deals with smartphones or, generally speaking, new recent developments in technology. So, and as I mentioned, all the articles you'll read for this unit are on that subject. Okay, so what are some of the other voices he includes to show that he's engaging with that larger conversation? The first is what I just mentioned, McGonagall, not the professor from Harry Potter, but still a very wise person, I believe. And she argues that play is possibly the best, healthiest, most productive activity a human can undertake. So I just explained on the last slide why she thinks this way, the support for her argument. And so I'm not going to recap that, but I'll just say that she's really showing the positive side here. And since, like I mentioned earlier, he leans more toward the negatives, it's important that he incorporate this view. When you write, you want to show multiple sides of a topic. And so by showing these positives, he's acknowledging while the negatives are concerning for him, there are these positives people should consider as well. Then he gives kind of his own view, which are concerns over addiction and corporate use. So. The negatives, the positives, he quotes someone else. The negatives really come from him. We can get addicted to these games and they take up a lot of our time. And then corporations can use them to market um, products to us without us even knowing sometimes. And that's certainly problematic, to say the least. Um, so he goes, in this section of the essay, he goes from quoting someone who outlines the positives to giving what he thinks are the negatives to then including one more voice which is Lance and Lance argues that and this is kind of a direct counter to Anderson so again he's incorporating someone with a different view and Lance is responding specifically to the very concerns Anderson raises by saying it's hard to design a good game so in other words corporations will only be able to take advantage of the stupid games to a certain extent because not every corporation will be able to design a really good game. <clears throat> Which may be a valid point. I mean, I think it might be easier than Lance says here, but um, we can see how that's a logical response to concern over corporate use. So Anderson has made his concerns clear, and then he's about the negatives. He's incorporated a statement about the positives, and then also a statement that kind of refutes what he says about the negatives. So he's showing to his audience the wide view of the topic, the larger context. Now in your own writing, this is something you'll want to do is include these other views. But one thing I would recommend you do that Anderson doesn't do here is restate your argument. So if I were Anderson or if you were Anderson here, I would recommend coming back after quoting Lance and saying why, despite the fact that games are hard to design, it's still, corporate use is still a concern. I think that's an effective rhetorical strategy he fails to use here. So now we're really on to the specifics. 
So gamification is a term unique to this article. And I asked you in the reading guide, it says something like, how does he use gamification? And so again, when you do your own reading guide, you'll want to come up with a couple specific questions, like my question on gamification. And I say, the definition, corporations use gameplay strategies to hook consumers. So whether that's designing their own games or just implementing things into the game, he uses the example of the Monopoly game. You can play at Safeway or McDonald's where you're basically playing a game, but you have to keep buying the product to, to play the game. That's gamification. <clears throat> and then that's the definition, but the question is why is it important? And so it's one of the potential negative effects of stupid games. If he's making the argument that <clears throat> stupid games have some negative effects, he needs to, to show what they are, and he does that through the example of gamification. All right, I think we're on to our last slide here. So what you finally want to do, and again, this is a general thing you'll want to always do with a reading guide, is summarize the article in your own words. So a paragraph, I think I have three to four sentences here. Again, if you can put something in your own words that shows you really understand it and you'll remember it better. Um, but rather than just summarizing the argument, this is my summary of the whole article. So I'll, I'll let this slide linger for a minute and you can read it as I read it out loud. In the article, just one more game, Sam Anderson gives an overview of stupid games. These are games that have been around a long time, but most recently can be found in examples such as Tetris and Angry Birds, where players become addicted to competing the same repetitive act, completing the same repetitive actions over and over again. Anderson aims to make readers aware of both the positive and negative effects of playing stupid games by pointing out that this type of gameplay can be a health of activity, but also one corporations use to take advantage of consumers. <clears throat> Anderson fails to clearly pick a side. <coughs> he leans more toward the negatives outweighing the positives, but does, by in, but does end by indicating that stupid games play an important role in helping us think through major, major decisions about how we spend our time. So I give a really broad overview in the first sentence. Um, then I give a little bit of the history. Then I have his specific argument. So that third sentence is kind of like the thesis or the main argument. Um, but I've given a little more context before that. To compare this with my first slide on the argument, here I give a couple sentences of context and then the main argument. And when I give the main argument in that third sentence, I also um, give some specific examples that I didn't give before of one example of a positive effect and one example of a negative effect um, to give a little more specific detail than I did when I was just summarizing the argument, since here I'm summarizing the whole piece. And then I have a sentence where I kind of clarify that he doesn't pick a side, so we really know it's clear you know what his argument is. And then finally, I kind of I give that last thought to show, even though he doesn't pick a side and he leans more toward the negative, he does have an important point that kind of encompasses both the positives and the negatives. Um, what we may learn from that last sentence could be very negative, but the fact that stupid games allow us to do that is a positive. So five sentences, not very long, a summary of the whole article. So again, ideally at the end of your reading guide, you would also have you know a summary similar to this one for that article. Um, okay, so to kind of recap this lesson real briefly, we have um, critical reading is the emphasis. The reason why we're spending four weeks is on critical reading is that it will help you improve in your writing and give you some foundational reading skills for college and beyond. Our strategy for learning critical reading is to do reading guides and then an essay. First, we had a demonstration of a reading guide here. In your discussion board post this week, you'll fill out a reading guide as I filled out this one. And then finally, next week, you'll design your own reading guide. So hopefully that all makes sense and is really useful. Um, please let me know if you have any questions, and I look forward to hearing, seeing what you come up with for this. Enjoy the readings.